a podpaste and Dile creates original narrative story about how a guy's very personal insecurities turn into something way bigger than his problems. The following, while extremely informative, contains adult language and adult content. Listener discretion is advised. Cool. Dude! Does the size of your Johnson actually matter in the grand scheme of things? Yes. <laughs> because you gotta feel it. <laughs> the answer is it's better to have a bigger penis. <laughs> The fear of being too small has spawned a behemoth of an industry called the male enhancement industry. Penis worthy of a king? Was it a king's? Ex- you know, I'm gonna be, first off, I think it's a tough position to be in because it's like mid game penis. Right. Right. I was expecting more. You, sir, are too small. You must be bigger. The funny thing, though, is that most guys have an average size dinky. Have an average size dinky. Have an average size dinky. What do you mean by expectations? Well, you know, there's, you know, this, this stereotype, man, you know, and it's like, you know, if you're, if you're a brown skinned dude, you know, you, you most likely are packing some heat, you know, and I, again, you know, I, I think there are two types, man. You got, you got, you got showers and growers. Some people are just ready to go all the time and other people just need, need a little inspiration. Welcome to Digressions, a new podcast format brought to you by Cool Black Dudes Radio, Darren Lake and Podpaste that tells upfront unfiltered and sometimes uncomfortable audio stories and documentaries about racial and race-related topics. I'm your host, Darren Lake. I have always been interested in the human body, in particular why we put clothes on and why we aren't naked more. Like, what is actually stopping us from just being naked all the time? I've also been interested in the psychology and social norms around why we, as humans, do what we do. But funny enough, like most people, and from my findings looking at you men, In the Western world, I've always had a hesitation around the whole stripping down and skinny dipping naked with friends on a late summer's night. I've been with ladies before that obviously never saw me naked, and I was okay with that. And I've also been in the guys' locker rooms and showering with nothing on, and it got normal pretty quickly. But the guys are just half the population. I couldn't cope with taking it all off in front of you know, a group of women that I didn't know in a public setting. And my fear went deeper than all women. It was a particular race in a particular place. White women here in Australia. Uh, Just letting you know, side note, that I live here in Sydney, Australia. I'm obviously from America originally. When I approached this idea a while back, I didn't want it to be a quote unquote man talking about his penis. We've got enough of that happening everywhere. With toxic masculinity poking its steroid injected head into everything, it's hard to miss. This is how toxic masculinity permeates culture. As I shared my story, I was told... But obviously, I'm a man, so it's got to come from my point of view. At least part of this story. I do have an awesome woman named Jessa. Hi, Jessa. Hi, Darren. The nude blogger, who's going to help me tell that side of the story later on here. With that said, our modern Western Puritan society usually equates the human nude body to sex. Again, in particular, the female body is most notable for being sexy. But I feel that there is more to this conversation than society's conservative ways. It's got to do more with vulnerability. And the lack of being okay with being vulnerable plays a very important role in more than we think. Before I start, please note that a lot of these ideas, while I try to incorporate science-based evidence and facts are, at the end of the day, still mostly my feelings, theories, and opinions on a very deep and layered topic that I find of interest. So if you agree, disagree, or want to fact check me, by all means hit me up at holler, H-O-L-L-E-R, at coolblackdudes.com, or on the socials, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, blah, blah, blah. So with this investigation, we will go through different sections. Nikki, help me out. There are three major parts to this story. Part one racial stereotypes and size inadequacies. Part two, society's perceptions. Part three, vulnerability and the cultural impact. Thanks, Nikki. Okay, back to my question from the intro. Does size really matter? It's super generic and almost annoying saying it, but maybe there is more to it than just dick size, right? This was my hypothesis and I set out to prove it either right or wrong. On my quest to figure this out, I discovered a lot of interesting shit most of it pertaining to how different races, genders, cultures, and communities deal with the topics of penis size, body shaming, gender equality, and more. 
I was able to tap my awesome network of friends, family, and the internet community to stitch this investigation together and hopefully help you, the listeners, see that while we are showing off how smart and amazing we are with technology, we still, as a society, have a lot of growing to do. So join me, my friends, and random sound bites I pulled from the internet as we make the world equal again by all getting naked. Part one, Darren's story. True story. Let's rewind back to the summer of 1988. Picture this. I'm a six-year-old little boy in summer camp at the Boys and Girls Club of America. I'm in a swimming pool locker in Astoria, Queens, New York City. I love playing around in pools, beaches, and I loved and still love summer. My mom put me in camp because she didn't want me getting bored and in trouble over the long summer break. Gotta love moms for that. So yeah, back to the locker rooms in the summer of 1988. I can't remember the way it was set up, but for some reason, the entry to this pool for everyone in the camp, i.e. girls, was through the boys' locker room. So each time we went swimming, the girls had to walk through it. I think it was my first week there, and I didn't really know how it all worked. Or someone told me, and I just forgot. Side note, I was raised by mostly women. Grandma, mom, godmother, you get it. So at my house, all the women used to change in front of me. No big deal. Back to the pool. So I'm running around naked and taking forever to change, which was standard practice for me, doing whatever six-year-old boys do. And this annoying eight-year-old, yeah, I just remember him being like big and kind of an asshole, was talking to me and just saying some dumb shit. I can't remember the particular details, but I remember him basically tricking me into believing that no one was coming. I think one group of girls came through and the camp counselors gave a sort of warning to tell the boys that they needed to put the clothes on. I was half-dressed and threw a towel on. The girls went through. All was good. I was safe. So I went back to taking as long as possible. Again, I'm a six-year-old with undiagnosed attention issues to change into my bathing suit. And that big bullyish kid was like, yeah, all good. No one's coming through. He lied. Another set of girls came through and I was mid-changing and about five or even ten of those girls that, you know, were quote unquote my friends saw me naked. I was embarrassed to say the least. I didn't even know that emotion existed. Until then, if I could turn red, spoiler, I'm black. This is Cool Black Dudes Radio, so I'm just just letting you know. I would have. I think I experienced embarrassment for the first time. The word embarrass comes from the Portuguese root embarassa, which means to entangle or entwine. And feeling embarrassed often feels like being tied up or exposed. That's Michael Stevens from YouTube channel Vsauce. He does esoteric deep dives into random ideas using science and his cool voice. He's awesome. We'll hear a bit more from him later on. But how can a healthy amount of embarrassment be a sign that you are likable, forgivable, and trustworthy? Back to the story. Yeah, so the girls came through. Fuck, that was not cool. And to this day, I still remember trying to get my towel on, but it wasn't fast enough. And having all those kids laugh at me and point fingers, oh, that was that was not cool. Of course, like a goldfish, I forgot. Rest of the day happened, everything was fine. But that event subconsciously stuck with me for a very long time. Other black guys feel the same way. It's not just in my head, but also a neurosis shared by other black men. How many? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure there is an anxiety that runs deep between us. I felt some pressure, man. This is Kerry Human from Portland, Oregon. He's my best friend, awesome dude involved in a whole bunch of cool shit, co-founder of Cool Black Dudes, and one of the main reasons why I had to do this investigative podcast. Here's a snippet from a convo we had. You know, like I wasn't... I wasn't quite sure if there were any expectations. You know, my girlfriend was there, so I knew she could vouch for me, but it's like, you know. (laughs) What do you you mean by expectations? What do you mean by expectations? Well, you know, there's, you know, this, this stereotype, man, you know, and it's like, you know, if you're, if you're a brown skinned dude, you know, you, you most likely are packing some heat, you know? And I, again, you know, I, I think there are two types, man. You got, you got, you got showers and growers, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to go too deep into that, you know, cause I know that's part of, you know, what you'll be sharing, but it's like, you know, some, some, some people are just ready to go all the time and other people just need, need a little inspiration. You know what I mean? And I just felt a little intimidated because I thought there was going to be this espe- expectation behind like how big I should be. And obviously I didn't think anyone was just going to be like, Oh, is that it? Or, Oh, I thought all black guys had like, you know, it's like, 
I, I feel comfortable in myself, but I guess just, you know, just from that stereotype, man, you know, it's like, I'm not walking around with, you know, fucking, you know, fucking Wesley Pipe. Speaking of Wesley, here's a cut from Wesley Morris's awesome pop culture podcast, Still Processing, where he talks on the same issues that Carrie and I have. So in the piece, I talk about this time when I was 24 and I lived in San Francisco and I took this guy home from a bar and we were about to... I don't know what we were going to do, but it involved sex. Mm -hmm. Um, Uh. (laughs) And, uh, (laughs) and, you know, we were going to have this hookup and he saw my dick and was like, really? That's, that's your dick. And I'm like, yeah, this is a normal dick. And I, and he said, basically, you know, this is not what I was expecting. What do you think he was (laughs) expecting? I don't know. I think he was expecting the biggest dick he'd ever seen. The fetish and hypersexualization of black men. When a man doesn't sleep with you right away, oh, oh, it's not because he respects you. (laughs) It's because he has a small dick. It was a black dude. Unless you live under a rock or in a place with no internet, black guys have big dicks is just standard fireside locker room sort of chat. It's been proven by medical studies and from my observation in locker rooms that it's not true. But with these areas like the porn industry, mainstream media, and rappers and just hip-hop culture in general, it's hard to ignore. And when people say it enough, you kind of start believing it. Funny, to me, there really seems to only be three groups of people that talk about this. Again, These groups are just based on my general observation of living as a human over the last 37 years. I'm big on science and evidence, but sometimes you just got to say how you feel and what you think you know. These groups that I think that like to talk about how big the black penis is are... Number one, black guys. Number two, white women. Number three, white guys or non-black men. Cool. Let's start with number one. Black guys. Yeah, there are dudes of all races with big dicks. These dudes love talking about how big their dick is, like, all the time. What's the saying? How do you know a guy has a big dick? Oh, he'll show and tell you. It's pretty annoying. I know a few people that say, oh, yeah, I have this friend that's always talking about what's showing us how big his dick is. This is where we get the dick measuring contest from, I think. Like, it's a thing. I believe these guys are just holding on to the stereotype to help give their ego a boost. They have some inadequacy somewhere else in their life. And it just seems like it's filling a void. Side note. According to extensive studies by scientists, there are many male animals that like displaying their brightly colored and interestingly shaped penises to other females during the mating stages. This isn't just a photo of their penis, because we have technology. Obviously, animals don't. They show the full package, no pun intended, like they're selling to the female. So it's their bodies, it's their strength, it's, it's all those things. While men, based on these, these studies, while men are showing their dicks and it's like, you know, inherent in nature, it actually makes no sense to do it now in modern society. White women. This is an interesting one, as I thought they were safe. And I never really encountered this in real life, but I get this underlying passive sense I could be wrong. That white women in particular, and a certain type, the ones that are mostly into black guys, they have this expectation. I could be wrong here, but it's just a hunch. They are few and far between, and I've really never had this actually said to me in real life. But again, from the porn I see and the sexual innuendos that are out there from just random people in general, it's hard to avoid this shit. Words and beliefs are powerful, even without true evidence behind them. Rather than talk about this, I'll let a conversation I had with first-time nude beach attenders and white females, Martina and Kristen, say what I mean. This stupid stereotype, um, which has been otherwise debunked multiple times by people saying black guys are subject to all penis sizes, just like any other man on this planet. I don't think there's necessarily that much truth to the stereotype. In my experience, I've never seen, like, more than one black penis. 
Um, so I'm only going off that. Um, other than that, you know, uh, it really just depends on the person. I feel like that's something really difficult. Like you can't measure, um, in terms, well, (laughs) in terms of just looking and just looking at someone's physique, you know, like it's, it's hard to make a preconceived notion until you actually see the thing. Yeah. Fully, fully erect or fully not erect. And then you take a measuring tape to it and then you can do, you know, the breakdowns. But, um, I think society, obviously, yes, but I've only seen one, so I can only go, go and base it off that. White men and known black guys. So if it's not the white women that I know, then who is it? Let's get this on the record. I love joking about sex just as much as the next person. Joking is okay, right? Maybe too much. Is that okay? I'd say yeah in healthy doses, but some people take it too far. Usually white men or non-black men are the ones. They're almost scared in this weird, sort of funny and passive, awkward kind of way. Always talking about my big dick and what it's going to do to whatever woman out there. They don't even know it, but it's subconsciously creating an expectation that I've been forming throughout my adult life. But why do they go to these jokes? It's got to be an insecurity somewhere. I actually recently had a very similar thing come to hand. This is Rebecca, who is a former spokesperson from the group Young Nudists of Australia that I'm a part of. Unfortunately, due to social normities across different like cultures, countries, different religions and stuff, means that disproportionately in Australia, more nudists tend to be of the fairer skin tone or of an Anglo background. So people who are maybe Indian of background or um, Asian of some description or, like yourself, more uh, darker skinned, or even Aboriginal Australians. Culturally back home or when you've been growing up in your home or, or the representation within your personal like sphere isn't based around social nudity. Whereas a lot more angleized cultures have, like, you've got your Swedish saunas, you know, the Japanese have their onsen baths, and all those sorts of things tend to be quite that northern European wedge. And so that's why I feel that, uh, unfortunately, disproportionate in this country of bastards, of mixed races, of immigrants, of pretty much everyone here is an immigrant except for the Aboriginal Australians, and they don't necessarily view nudity the way that we do. Um, And they've been quite anglicised by colonisation. So all of that is why it would be perceived and harder for you for as you've said you feel that and your friends who are of who are black feel that it's not necessarily for you or that you're prejudged and sexualized in nature so kinked so you guys are a fetish you're fetishized so that's it i got to the root of my initial issue it was actually mostly white men and the media that gave me this sense of inadequacy in my flaccid state the podcast could end here right But there's more to this story than just me. I think it might have to do with vulnerability and the world's lack of being okay with being vulnerable. But before we jump out of racial standards with nudity and dive into society standards around nudity, I think Wesley Morris sums it up best. This is this ongoing stigma against something that is very normal to black people, Mm -hmm. which is a penis. And I think we have been both given this legacy of of what it means to have a black penis, what it means to be intimate with one. Yeah. And I mean that both for men and for women. And I just don't have those feelings about mine. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. other people give them to me. Western culture versus the world. Let's go back in time again, but only to about the summer of 2003. I'm staying at my friend's house for a summer painting houses freelance, just to get some side money. He lived on a farm and had a pretty big house with a lot of bedrooms. There were always people staying over as they had a lot of space. It was an awesome environment. We told his family that we would be leaving out around 8 a.m. the next morning for some work, but it was ongoing work, so we pretty much could choose when and what time we wanted to leave. 
Of course, we wake up late and his brother and fiance were visiting on that day out of town. Since the house was quiet, they actually couldn't hear us. I then proceeded to go to the bathroom because it was the morning. I think it was about 9.30 at this point. So as I'm done at the bathroom, I'm leaving out and I hear a woman laughing and running down the hardwood floors coming towards the bathroom. I knew it was his brother's fiance, so I opened the door, like, whatever, and she was passing or about to go in the bathroom. You know, standard shit, no pun intended. As I open the door, I see, and I remember this, and I have to give you the, the, the exacts because it's still burned into my brain, a very dark and tan-toned white woman with very noticeable tan lines. It was summer. And absolutely nothing on standing in front of me. Like putting your hand on a hot pan, it took both our brains exactly 1.5 seconds to process it all. For novelty's sake, this type of shit never happens to me, and I still have that image burned in my brain. Once I realized it was her naked, out of pure respect, I turned away as fast as possible and shut the door. Of course, her smile turned into a absolute frown of disgust and horror. She covered herself up and shrieked away back to the bedroom. I was like, what the fuck? It's way too early for this shit. And both my friend and his brother came out like, WTF, man, WTF, what, yo, what just happened? I heard her crying. I go back to my room, kind of laughing, kind of feeling bad for seeing her naked. And I tell my friend what happened and his brother. They both start kind of laughing and are like, oh, shit. His brother yells at us and is like, man, weren't you guys supposed to leave early? What, what, why were you still here? And we're just like, whatever, dude. We all kind of shrug it off. I was not invited to their wedding a few months later. And I heard that she still to this day is terrified to see me. A bit excessive? Maybe, maybe not. Who am I to judge? Why do we wear clothes? I'm going to let Michael from YouTube channel Vsauce dive deep on a few things via science and his theories. So why do we wear clothes? Clothing protects us from the cold, from rain, from the sun. And it can also be an ornament, a way of accentuating certain parts of our bodies or showing off wealth, status. It can even help us build our own identities. Europeans and South Americans already know that when we go swimming, it's pretty stupid to wear clothes that get wet, then you change out of them into dry clothes. Do we shower with our clothes on? Swimming shouldn't be an exception, right? Like everything, there are some scientific claims to back up this illogical behavior behind our Western fear of nudity. Embarrassment is a fascinating emotion and an extremely social one. You don't really ever feel embarrassed alone when no one's watching you or listening to you. So embarrassment probably evolved because it is such a good influence on social cooperation. We feel embarrassed when we violate little social rules of conduct and each of us individually hoping to avoid that, to avoid embarrassment, has helped all of us live together better. Healthy brains experience embarrassment. Neurodegeneration of the frontal and temporal lobes can lead to less awareness of yourself. So a healthy amount of occasional embarrassment is a good thing. It's a sign of a socially adept and normally functioning brain. Thanks, Michael. I'll just sum up what he says in the video as it's super interesting, pretty deep, and I highly recommend you go and watch it yourself. There's a link in the show notes. He then proceeds to speak on how a study showed that people trust other people who feel embarrassment more. It makes them more human. Other studies speak about the fear of nakedness, which predates clothing in humans. It stems from how animals play cat and mouse chase games like we do in the courting stage of a relationship. But the emotions of shame and modesty trump embarrassment with humans, especially when it comes to our genitalia. Then shit gets even more interesting as the BBC did a study and talked about how raising children is why we might wear clothes. Human newborn babies are born very unready for life because we are so brilliant. Our brain proportion to our body size is off the charts compared to all other animals. Brain size is correlated with body size. Bigger bodies require bigger brains. The shrew has a smaller brain than a human, but us humans have smaller brains than whales. Of course, a bigger brain is not indicative of intelligence. For one thing, larger animals literally just have more cells they need to worry about and control. What matters more If you haven't watched his videos, which I highly recommend because they're pretty amazing, he always ends up going on these crazy rants that don't seem to come back to the question he posed in the beginning. But then right at the end, he does a, a pretty hard 
pivot almost awkwardly and answers it just point blank. Under this theory, being naked and mating all of the time might be a little bit less of a priority for humans. Humans and societies that privilege modesty would have more time and resources to put toward raising children and avoiding extra mates instead of just conceiving more kids, allowing kids to develop properly and reproduce themselves. Clothing serves this purpose quite well. It conceals the privates and allows more time to be spent on other things. Clothes, clothing, may in a way actually be a consequence of our unique intelligence. So the next time you put on clothes, keep in mind that one of the reasons you're not running out into the world butt naked is because you have such a big brain. I see. Damn, well that makes sense. Facts all day. And I can't argue with science or his theories on scientific journals. I still feel that we have a choice though to be vulnerable and that other things in our society are holding us back from being okay with our uniqueness, being flawed and just who we are. I'm also big on anecdotal evidence and stories because they're fun. So let's hear from some people that I know that aren't the quickest to take their clothes off in front of random folks. If you're self-conscious, you're not gonna, you're not gonna take off your clothes in front of strangers. This is Matt. He's my friend that painted with me that summer and was there when I saw his brother's wife naked. How apropos. But this statement though, because I don't look good naked. And this one. You know, I'm overweight. Are sentiments shared by a lot of people, and in particular men, when I ask them to come get vulnerable with me at the Sydney Skinny Swim. Why is that? I don't think I have a particular fear of being naked or something. This is my other friend Dave. He lives in Sydney and would be definitely more on the hippie, burning man, free love side of things when it comes to nudity. But there's definitely a stigma around just showing it all off and letting it go, I think. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I suppose I have my own reservations about... Uh, just being fully naked. So he surprises me when he declines my invitation to come to the annual nude swim every year. We chatted for a bit longer and he ends up dropping a bomb of knowledge to why being fully naked isn't that easy. Where do those come from? Oh man, we all have body issues, don't we? I mean, it could be anything from feeling uncomfortable with the way that I looked when I was younger and was heavier. Um, As a kid, you know, I sort of was overweight and would be teased for that kind of thing. So it's not even just about private parts or anything like that. But um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've heard you talk about stigma around the size of your penis and that kind of thing. And I'm not sure if it's always the thing on your mind, but definitely it's not a situation that we're used to being in. And so I think, you know, anything that's different or new is going to be a little uncomfortable. That is something I hadn't considered. And now I understand. Men of all races, just like women, have body issues. It's rare to hear it from a man, but the fact that a lot of men don't want to go to the beach and take their shirts off is a very scary and big deal for them. But again, why is that? I think vulnerability definitely is at play when we um, look into nudity and being nude in private and in public. This is Jessa, the nude blocker. Go check her out on Instagram. She's dope. We'll hear more from her soon. Men versus women on nudity. Now we fast forward to 2012. I moved to Sydney, Australia and find out that nude beaches were plentiful. My interest peaks a lot, but oh, the fear. How could these white women see me in a flaccid state? I'm a grower, not a shower, damn it. Then I found out that there was a swim, a nude swim. I can't go to a nude beach for the first time by myself. And yeah, I can't tell any of my friends that I want to do this. Because then they'll think I'm a pervert or weird or ignore me, which they already do. But now I could finally shed the fear from that incident when I was embarrassed as a kid and also see if it's possible to be naked with people in a non-sexual way. The event that enabled me to do this is the Sydney Skinny Swim, which I'll talk about in a bit. Something interesting also happened when I asked and suggested to all my friends in Sydney to come to the swim. This was the first time around. I've been, this is going to be my fourth year. As expected, most people shied away or ignored me. But it seemed like more women than men were interested in doing it. Yes, hesitant, but in a, hmm, that would be kind of interesting and awesome to do. I didn't understand it. I've attended the swim three times now and would say there actually is a nice mixture of men and women. Actually, way more women than one would expect at something like this, because usually nude beaches have a lot of guys there. But the fact that 
of the nine people that came last year, there was only two guys beside me in the photo, I'm going to assume that some to most guys have a fear like me. Yeah, but what happens when you're on that nude beach and you see a beautiful girl and you get turned on? This was actually my issue all along with the whole white women expectation thing. From what I read, most seasoned nudists, naturists, said that, yeah, sometimes it happens, but actually being nude doesn't immediately mean sexually turned on. As I dig deeper into male fear, it seems that men might have more issues than being vulnerable than women. Ah, that word vulnerability. vulnerability. It keeps popping its head into this conversation. And he was completely naked. Mm -hmm. There was no prosthetic penis there. He, he decided to go for it. Mm -hmm. um, and just being aware of his vulnerability mm -hmm. and how, because that's the truth. When we're naked, we are vulnerable. We do, why are we all walking around in clothes? You know, and yes, it is a strength, of course, if it's, you can, we can use that strength, but in reality, and that's what I love about Westworld, is that it's showing the vulnerability and the, the objectification of a person. And if you see a person naked, not in a sexual context, you're suddenly, you don't want to look. Part three, vulnerability and the group mentality. I'm big on hearing both sides of a story, and with nudity, there are definitely two very strong forces at play. Round one. On one side, you have mainstream society and media, uh, until now, a studio in New York has decided to open its very first nude gym sessions. Gross. On the other side, you have Jessa, the nude blogger. So people's fear of, you know, one, getting naked um, and two, embracing change. So they're the two bigger obstacles in raising consciousness is that we are inclined to stick to habits and to go along with our conditioning. Round two. On our left side is mainstream media and society. Totally gross. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine someone bending over and no. saying, I mean, I don't care how good their body is. And on our right side is Jessa, the nude blogger. So my biggest hurdle in helping to raise awareness about non-sexual nudity is mostly males sexualizing my naked body. Mainstream media. I mean, it's just so revolting. You know what it is? It's for perverts and exhibitionists. And, you know, I don't care how good your body is. When you're straining over a hot whatever, you know, unless it's a person. I mean, really, do it in the privacy of your own home. Round three. Jessa. So, you know, I can't control the way people perceive me. I can put my message out there, but it doesn't mean it's going to be received the way I intend to put it out there. I think it's just an excuse for a perp. We are conditioned to usually, more than likely, associate nudity with sex. But, you know, get a room. If you want to show off, get a room. And that is the change I am trying to make, but in that I'm coming up against that very hurdle. Don't do it, it in a public me space. That public me space. That public me space. That a funny thing happens when everyone is doing something you aren't doing. You end up feeling like the fucking weirdo. It's interesting because it applies to even things that aren't socially accepted like public nudity. So how does that one work? Herd mentality. The tendency for people's behavior or beliefs to conform to those of the group to which they belong. From an article from Psychology Today, I'm going to kind of quote and subquote everything. As Julia Cultis, a researcher at the University of Essex, puts it, for an individual joining a group, copying the behavior of the majority would then be a sensible, adaptive behavior. A conformist tendency would facilitate acceptance into the group and would probably lead to survival if it involved the decision, for instance, to choose between a nutritious or poisonous food, based on copying the behavior of the majority. In our evolutionary past, our ancestors were under constant threat. Keen awareness of others helped our ancestors survive in a dangerous and uncertain world. Modern humans have inherited such adaptive behaviors. These behaviors include banding together and promoting social harmony. This includes not dissenting from the group. In a hunter-gatherer group, being ostracized or banished could have been a death sentence. Thoughtful reflection of social influence may lead us to a greater awareness of ourselves and our relationships with others. End quote. Aha, that's it. We need to all band together and make this nudity thing normal. If we can do this in smaller groups, my idealistic and optimistic mind thinks it's possible on a larger scale. Picture this. At the end of a charity-focused nude swim, the Sydney Skinny, there's a beach full of 300-plus naked people and a few event staff wrapping and cleaning shit up. Now, the event staff had clothes on as they weren't part of the event even though a lot of the nudist community that I'm a part of and myself think that they should have actually worked naked, which would have been pretty good. 
So everyone at the end of the swim is hanging out, talking with friends, basking in how absolutely awesome it is to be around everyone naked. Yeah, good. Just like it was any other informal ocean swim. And freeing. It did feel natural very quickly. And vulnerable. And it's just an experience for people to get out and be vulnerable around each other and get rid of the layers of clothing that you have around society. And liberating. Seeing everyone so comfortable being naked made me comfortable. And everything in the middle. And it really strips people back to who they are. And it, it felt incredibly natural so quickly on, uh, which is something that surprised me. I didn't expect that. Uh, so that was really nice. That was cool. Our group of 10 fully naked individuals decides to take some photos to remember the day, as you would, because, I mean, it doesn't happen every day, so it's not real unless you take photos. So I look at these masculine, bearded-up men who are the security guards, and I'll assume that they're straight. And I'm like, yo, 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 yo can yo, you yo, um, yo. can you go take a photo? Take a photo of our the look I got was priceless. They both turned into, like, little schoolboys <laughs> that saw a bra for the first time or something and then realized what it was. It was the most innocent and also embarrassing thing for them. They hurried up and took photos of us, and I think they were trying to enjoy or at least take in the view of seven beautiful women naked in front of them. But their, their awkwardness, it seemed, was, was overpowering that. I can't even try to sum up the combination of emotions that they were having, but witnessing it was, was very interesting, which leads me to my next point about nudity. Why is it okay for guys to make jokes about their naked bodies and it not be sexual? If a female were to do what Chris Pratt is about to talk about, it wouldn't go over the same way. And of course, they give you these briefs that are like uh, like little underwear, but that are, are skin colored because they'll pixelate it out. When I, I knock on the door and Amy Poehler's character opens the door and says, Andy, and, I, and I'm naked and that's the bit. Well, it was like late in the day and Amy was going, Andy, but it, to me, it didn't seem like she really was reacting to seeing my dick. <laughs> and so I was like, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna drop my trowel as an improv. I'll show open the door and then that will be the take that they'll use, right? By the way, it is the take of the uh, She opens the door and she goes, Andy, whoa! <laughs> and then I got a letter from NBC saying basically, never, ever do that again. You can, there is a protocol to being naked. You must give everyone the option to not see it. Normalizing the female body. I'm a cool black dude. Cool. And rather than talk about women and how they feel, why not get a specialist on the subject? I am a yoga instructor, a naked yoga instructor, and a blogger. Again, this is Jessa, the new blogger. And exhale, you feel your breath, leave your chest, feeling your navel contract your spine. So the main reason for me teaching my fempowerment workshops and mixed naked yoga really is to raise consciousness. That is my big aim. That's the big picture of all of this. So to raise awareness and to help broaden people's perceptions. It begins with themselves and then hopefully starts to, you know, reflect in the world around them and then the bigger picture. That's the main thing. From our conversations, while she gets a lot of love and admiration from the public, there's also a dark and shitty side to showing the world, your naked body. Pornography plays a big role in that because a lot of young boys out there are seeing a naked body and seeing sex. So therefore, when they see a naked body outside of pornography, they think of sex. And it's advertising with social media now. It is everywhere. It's pervasive as hell. Um, it's, It's in advertising. It's everywhere. It's like it's being imprinted into our brains everywhere we look because everyone's using sex to sell something. So we've not actually been educated or taught how to look at the human body in a non-sexual way. She's part of the Young Nudists of Australia group that I was talking about, and she is trailblazing an awesome path with the visions to help empower people by being nude. So I think desexualizing the human body can definitely lead to and have benefits such as, you know, gender equality in the workplace um, and just in general. We've been living in quite a patriarchal system for the last few centuries, um, and This system has been built on, you know, objectifying the female body. So, and this, and by objectifying the female body, not knowing how to differentiate sexual and non-sexual nudity. And so I think that, you know, there are a lot of 
people out there that would say that if a woman dresses a certain way, dresses, you know, what we consider sexy, that she's asking for sex. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be this way. You know, when, when men can look at a woman in a non-sexual way, a woman can then express her sexuality in the way that she, that is authentic to her and project that rather than having the male project his sexual fantasies or his, you know, his idea of sex onto a female, you know, wouldn't it be nice if a female could project her authentic sexuality and, you know, ask for it in the way that she wants it. And I think then we can be on more of an equal playing field. This is the change that I think needs to happen. The more women that are owning their nude bodies, the less it becomes a thing. I 100% think that nudity, I mean, we're generalizing here, but nudity and being comfortable being naked could save the world because it. there are so many layers to this. There are so many layers to being comfortable naked. Yeah, it might take hundreds of thousands of women to be nude more, but this will then desensitize the public on women's bodies. Stop objectifying them and also put them on a more equal playing field. We're not vulnerable enough in society. We're always wearing too many layers, too many masks, too many facades, too many labels, too many roles. You're the mum, you're the worker, you're the teacher, you're a student, you're this, you're that. And really, when we, so many of us don't know how to peel away those layers. We're too heavily identified. And if we can learn to be vulnerable, and that means shedding the layers physically and shedding the layers metaphysically, so emotionally, then 100% when you can learn to be comfortable naked and learn to be less judgmental and, and learn to project your perceptions onto people a little less, then yes, this world is going to be a far better place. The Libertarian Utopia exists. The event is a 300 metre or a 900 metre untimed ocean swim nude. It's a joyous communal celebration of all that is good about this life, this world and this beautiful city. It's a chance to uh, seek a bit of freedom in our society that we are getting less and less of. It's an event specifically designed to make us concentrate on the good things. The energy was just great. That was a promo from the organizers of the Sydney Skinny. They were on Cobbler's Beach. Cobbler's Beach is that once a year place that hosts 1,500 people swimming naked mostly for the first time. It's also, first and foremost, an awesome little 100% legal, nude, naturist beach community tucked away in Middlehead on the north side of Sydney. It's a 500 meter hike down a dirt trail once you park or ride your bike, and you get a beautiful side of Sydney from the other side. All of the houses in the cliffs iconic Balmoral Beach straight ahead, and super calm water even on a windy day because it's protected. It even has a huge shaded grass patch that lends itself to being very nice for the melanin-deprived Australians out there that want to be at the beach all day but also don't want to be in the sun. Like how being nude made regular Cobbler's Beach attender, fellow cool brown dude, and 11-year season pro nudist Chanika just chill out and not be so rigid. I think I'm a a little bit more easier going because of being a nudist, like... Um, I'm a very structured person. Um, I guess maybe my, you know, being an engineer, we we learn to be structured, think in a structured way. So, but that's not the way to live life, though. It's there's a place and time for being structured. But sometimes you need to let it go and just life isn't structured. You got to go with the flow. And this has taught me to sort of mellow more to that. So, so um, that's that's the reason why. This beach is also one of the few and least creepy family-friendly new beaches. Yeah, I'm putting all the men out there that end up being creeps on blast. Sorry. Uh, it's a very fragile setting, the, 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 the nude beach public setting, because everyone's vulnerable. And it's real easy to cross the line. But again, at this beach, I've seen full families here from moms with babies to young kids to teens, um, all sitting next to older men you know, like elderly men sometimes, then all next to a bunch of young women, next to LGBTQ folks. Like, they all just mingle together, and there rarely seems to be any issues. 
I feel that if there was less focus on physical attraction and the currency of sex within interpersonal relationships between people of different or varying genders, that it would be a lot easier for people to get along and that there would be more deeper relationships formed on a basis of friendship and mutual respect rather than sexual attractiveness to people of different genders to themselves. What do we do with this? It's the end. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for taking this journey with me. But since I'm all about benefits and solutions to any problem, what do you do moving forward with all of this information and wisdom that I just dropped inside your eardrums? It was a lot. If you're all about nudity and naturism, by all means, keep doing you and your part in changing the world. Fuck society's norms, right? A bit more from Chanaka who shares his experience at the nude beaches early on, but how that has slowly turned into a positive experience. So the first time I came here, yeah, I did get quite a few stares, like, because I was on, the only brown guy, yeah. and I wasn't even black. I was like, wow, what are you? You know, people of your colour don't come. But I think that was in 2007, but slowly more and more brown people have started to come, and I've seen Indian couples come here, brown couples as well. Yeah, the South Asian subcontinental couple. And I met some really great people here. They feel sorry for me because I was originally here on my own. And no, now it's all you've seen, you know, there's a bit more of a big crowd here, Asian people, African people, which is good to see, um, and people from between. So I think it's slowly sort of changing over time. If you're on the other side and you're totally against it, this whole nudity, naked thing freaks you out. But again, you've been listening this far, so it's really interesting that you would be against it and you've actually listened to it. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not mad at you. Um, this just isn't for you. I get it. Keep on being a textile. Yes, that's the name for people that wear clothes at the beach inside the nudist community, textiles. And hopefully you have a better understanding of why people choose to be nude. But if you're on the fence and are now interested but are a bit scared and don't know the next steps, take some advice from the nude blogger. For people looking for tips on how to get more comfortable naked, start off at home. Start off being naked, brushing your teeth, watching TV, doing the dishes, doing the laundry, doing your admin. Get comfortable naked in your own company. Maybe start off with a friend, um, whether it's just at the house. And then, you know, maybe head to um, a decent nude beach. Come along to a naked yoga session, for example, and get naked stretching out and, and realize that, you know, in naked yoga, like no one's looking at you going, oh my God, look at that person. Because everyone's like so just thinking about themselves in their own zones. We all realize it's it's no big deal. Once you can get comfortable naked in your own company, um, you'll slowly be able to do it around other people. What turned out to be a quest for me to get over my issues with my flaccid penis size ended up becoming a journey that I'm still on to find equality in all of us. While I might be an idealist in my libertarian utopian ways, I think there is some truth in people becoming more real and more vulnerable by undressing their fears and inadequacies and showing everyone, hey, maybe my problems aren't as big as I thought. This audio story was produced by Podpaste in collaboration with Cool Black Dudes and executive produced by Darren Lake. Supervising producer, Alison Chan. Narrated by Nikki Thomas. Advising editor, Chuck Xavier. Music, sound design, and audio mixing by Darren Lake. All right, going to treat this as an encore of sorts. Looking at you, J. Cole, Far Hills Drive, 2014. But again, if I said something that was incorrect or made you feel a certain way, I'd love to hear. Bad or good? Hit me up at holler, H-O-L-L-E-R, at coolblackdudes.com or on any of the socials, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and we can talk. Lots of special shout-outs here. Huge thanks to Jessa, the nude blogger, Cool Black Dudes and the Cool Black Dudes Collective, looking at you, Carrie Human, Chris Franklin. What up, Chuck Xavier? The young nudist of Australia. Get Naked Australia. Black Naturist Association. You guys are dope. I found you at the end of making this. I would love to get some sound bites from you, but I'll get you on the next one, I promise. Nadia, Matt L, Dave Hoff, Rebecca Lee, Tina, Allison Chan, Phil Cross and Master of Some, Chanika, can't forget about you, my fellow nudist, cool brown dude. Thank you for being you, man. Acast, Audiocraft, Nikki Thomas. Thank you, thank you, and more thank you. Symbol, aka Young Symbolic, I see you. Phil Bowie, I see you too. Y'all dudes ain't even know. Y'all help me. The modern women, 
offline the podcast. And if I missed you, I'm sorry, but thank you. I know you were there. Hopefully I can produce and have more conversations about layered topics like this one moving forward. Please watch this space. Peace. We are an organization that's really looking forward to um, breaking those stereotypes around nudity and especially with the black community. Uh, For so long, nudity has been associated with uh, sexualism and or um, some type of sexual act, especially if you think about, you know, going back to um, uh, slavery days. And so we're trying to break that stigma and really bring the news to everyone that everybody is beautiful and it is Um, okay to be nude, okay to embrace where you are, whether you're big, small, young, or old. Well, yeah, I guess it's that logic that bikini versus nude doesn't make any difference to the parts you want to hide. Uh, We meet many people that look like us, that have this look of thanks on them, that say thank you. I didn't know there were more people out there that were like me, and I'm glad to join your organization. We're so exposed to so many, you know, fit, perfect figure type bodies on social media that this is kind of standing up to that. These are just normal, everyday people, comfortable in their bodies, loving the skin they're in, out in nature, having a laugh and feeling good about themselves. It's almost like ripping off a Band-Aid. Like, you you don't know what to expect. You go, and and like I said, I was probably one of the only uh, people of colour there. Um, It's all white people, typically older white people, and eventually I was like, okay, you just have to take it off. And you take it off and you sit there, you wonder, are people looking at me? And then when you realize they're not looking at you, you're like, okay, that's great. Bunch of people getting together naked could be considered a church gathering. This is church. Yep, well, it's Sunday. I'm worshipping Helios, (laughs) the god of the sun. I like that. Oh, is it? My thought would be that the experience of having a naked swim, being around people, would allow you to get beyond that. You get beyond that idea of judging people, that beyond that idea of, of, you know, identifying ownership or, or saying, oh, like, you know, maybe she could put some makeup on and be cuter or whatever it's going to be. It's just like you're saying, it. it's an experience being naked with other people is an experience that teaches us more about how we come together and how we foster that idea of belonging to this human race as opposed to being individuals that are judged by one another or something. I don't know. Oh, my God. You just, you summed up like that. That might be the end right there. That's like the end. You summed up everything that I've been thinking because I've been trying to end this. Like, I've written the script for it, and I was like, ah, and I've thrown together ideas, and I was like, maybe that'll be it. But that's it because I'd rather it be another voice, and I think it will be really cool. From the guy that's never done the swim, I think it will be really cool to have your voice. That's the idea of it, isn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm stopping this. Cool. Dude!